It's Robin, and good morning or afternoon, everyone, wherever you might be. We're excited to start the new year in collaboration with PASA to present a new webinar on a topic that's of interest to all of you, which is how sanctuaries can work with the media. And today we have three great presenters to share their experience and expertise with you. Uh, Jean Fleming has years of experience in developing web content and marketing communication strategies for companies in both the for-profit and non-profit sectors. And as communications manager for PASA, Jean creates content to promote the work of PASA members and bring attention to the issues that impact them. Today, she's gonna to tell us more about that and she'll take us through the steps of pitching a story. And we're also delighted to have the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, or NAPSA, join us today. Erica Fleury is NAPSA's program director and is also the author of the book, Monkey Business, A History of Non-Human Primate Rights. In her support of the work of NAPSA member sanctuaries, Erica devotes much time to advocacy on behalf of captive primates in North America, bringing attention to the exploitation of primates and the critical role of sanctuaries. And we'll hear the sanctuary perspective on engaging with the media. How should you prepare your sanctuary and staff when reporters or film crews visit? It's not only a matter of controlling your message, but also making sure everyone follows certain guidelines and protocols. GFAS accredited and NAPSA member Chim Haven is the subject of a six part series presented by National Geographic on Disney Plus Channel that premiered last October. And if you haven't seen it yet and have access, we definitely would recommend it. We'll hear from Taylor Johnson, Chim Haven's Chief Development and Marketing Officer about her experience, along with some valuable advice and lessons learned. But before we begin, I'll turn things over to Caitlin Bach from PASA to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, I also want to thank Robin and Jackie at GFAS for working with PASA to organize this event. These webinars have been a great way for all the sanctuary networks to connect during the pandemic, and I'm looking forward to hearing today's speakers. Thanks. Thank you, Caitlin. And now we'll get started and hear from our speakers, beginning with Jean. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you today, um, and I'm excited to share uh, a story about how we got some nice coverage recently. Um, and, and in sharing that story, I hope to also give you some tips on how to pitch successfully and how you can use Twitter as a great tool for pitching. So let's jump in there. Um, so I just to set it up, my philosophy on pitches is that it's part art and part science. Um, and as the art is the storytelling element, you have to find the thing that really pulls the heartstrings. And then the science piece of it is equally important, and that's finding the, the right reporter, the right outlet, the best channel for your story to, to reach the audience that you want to find. So I'm going to walk you through this story that we recently got. It's from uh, National Geographic, um, and it's a story that tells uh, about 25 monkeys that were uh, confiscated uh, en route from the DRC to uh, South Africa, we believe. They were, the traffickers were caught in Zimbabwe and the reporter did a great job kind of unpacking the story and putting it into a, a bigger frame. So we're gonna talk about how that came to be. Um, just as a kind of a sense of how long these things take, um, this is the timeline uh, from start to finish, uh, the initial pitch to the final publication, a little over two months. Um, so it takes a while. Um, I am always impatient to see uh, a great story in the in the world. So I, I would love to be able to push that along, but I get it. They've got other things to do besides uh, tell our stories. Um, so speaking of uh, kind of getting all the ducks in a row, before I do a pitch, um, I will put together uh, what I consider, a, I call it a fact sheet. Um, and this is a quick screenshot of the one I put together for this story. Um, and it's just a one-stop shop for all the information that I'm gonna need in order to set the, the reporter up for success. So um, in this instance, there was a timeline of events uh, from the day the, the animals were confiscated and kind of everything that fell from there. There, uh, I've got all the sources, anybody who I think would be good for the reporter to talk to either 
uh, on the record, meaning they're going to get quoted, or on background, meaning uh, they're just going to provide background information but not being named as a source in the story, um, including all their contact information and everything like that. Um, and I always check with the sources ahead of time to make sure that they're comfortable being um, called. And if they want to do a prep session ahead of an interview, I will always do that with people. Um, so this is kind of what I use. It's my home base for creating a pitch. Um, and the, the thing I want to emphasize here is that when you, when you make a pitch, it's, it's really not about you. You know, we'd all love to get a story that sings the praises of our organizations and talks about how PASA is doing the most amazing work for primates. And, um, and, you know, I call those Valentines. You get them, maybe you get them once a year if you're lucky, right? Um, but mostly the stories are about things that everybody else in the world is interested in. Um, and so your job as a communications person is to find that hook that really um, connects with them. So once I've got my hook sorted out, um, I use Twitter like a maniac. Um, I, it's an incredible tool for finding reporters, seeing what they're talking about, what they're interested in, um, and just connecting with them directly. Actually, most of them um, are open for direct messages or uh, will have an email address in their bio. Um, so you can contact them directly. I've also, um, Twitter lets you create lists. So if you've never worked with that, it's an incredible tool. Um, I've got I've built lists in my profile of environmental journalists, and then uh, the Society of Environmental Journalists has a great list as well. So those are two things that I would really commend to you. If you don't have a list built yet, this is a great way to do it. Um, so initially, I uh, reached Rachel Bell, who is the animals editor at uh, National Geographic. She had tweeted uh, that she was open to pitches, which is great news. So um, I'm on that. So you can see here, uh, I sent her a direct message, took, a, I don't know what, about 10 days or so for her to get back to me. And then we kind of went from there. Um, she assigned it to a, a, an editor, a reporter named Rachel Fobar. This is the email that I got from Rachel. Um, and then the, the reason I've got that big orange arrow there is because Rachel, um, added this question into the uh, her email, uh, is it fair to say, blah, blah, blah. And I love it when reporters will do that because it tells me where their head is at on a story. What what does she think is the, the angle of approach? What's the controversy that she's smelling? Um, and getting a heads up like that is just gold because it lets me know um, if we, for instance, if one of our members had a concern or had a really special relationship, if this had been a governmental question, for instance, I would I would approach the answer to that question really differently than if uh, you know we were trying to do an expose, for instance. So I love to get those heads up questions, and the more you can get them telling you they're thinking, the better off you are in terms of getting a successful pitch. Um, so as Rachel was doing her interviews and um, just kind of trying to get all the facts and figures and details about the story together, she and I did a lot of uh, WhatsApping together, just kind of looking for answers. I had questions. We were trying to figure out what had happened with the traffickers, what was their sentence that had never come out anywhere, and she was trying to find the same information. So. So we really collaborated um, together on that. It's, uh, it wasn't simply just feeding her information. She was giving us information, too, about what she was finding. So it was a great partnership in that regard. Um, and then finally, uh, the story came out just, just before Christmas. Um, and it was a really uh, powerful piece. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I definitely commend it to you. Um, but we got this email, Greg Tully, our executive director, received this from one of his contacts at the State Department that he works with sometimes when we are hitting snags. Um, and the, they, the article moved them so much that they were willing to kind of try to help move this, the, the rescue aspect of the uh, story along, which was incredibly helpful to us. Um, so never underestimate what, the, what a good, a well-placed story and a, and a respected publication can do to, to advance your story. But just don't expect it to only be about you. The actual story in question here, we were we were quoted, but the story is not at all about us. It's about these animals and about the trafficking. And that's an issue that is um, incredibly important to our members. 
um, and highlighting the issues associated with that are uh, important to us. And one of our members was, in fact, interviewed for it. So those are all really good um, gains out of this piece. But again, it's, it's not about PASA. It's about this issue. Um, I'm just going to close with a few quick tips uh, for talking to the media. Um, if you don't do anything else, do that first one. Prepare for the call. Um, there is, it's just, it's the investment that will pay off for you every single time. Um, and these are the kinds of questions that I, I try to get people thinking about. You know, you you need to really boil down what you want the reporter to know to, to two or three key points. Uh, they are not going to remember five or seven or 20 things. They're going to remember two or three, even if they record the interview, even if they're taking great notes, you've got to know what your core messages are. So that's like numero uno there. Um, what's your sound? How are you memorable? What's, is there breakthrough language you can use that's going to re, kind of grab their attention? Um, uh, is there anything you really don't want to say? Uh, if, for instance, if there is a tender relationship in play uh, in one of the stories, you want to make sure you finesse that, so practice that. Um, and then the, the thing that every single reporter will always end their interview with is, is there anything else I should know? Or is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? Or some version of that question. It's open-ended, it's broad spectrum, and it's intended um, to get you to say something perhaps that you didn't want to say. Um, so it's always good to be aware that that could happen. Um, and it's also an incredible opportunity to kind of quickly think back in your mind, did I hit my three points? Is there something else I want to say? Is there a frame that I want to make sure this reporter has around the information before, uh, before we close it out? Um, the other things are, you know, reporters are trained to, to find controversy. That's uh, kind of, there's the old adage that if it bleeds, it leads. And um, so they're looking for that. They're smelling for that. They'll, they'll, they will ask questions about that. So you have to be ready for it um, and not get caught uh, in the headlights of that. Um, Take your time answering. It's always fine to say, you know, that's a great question. Let me think about that for a moment. Um, and then, of course, just follow up like crazy because, uh, as you saw, it can take months for a story to finally land. Uh, they're working on many stories at once, uh, and yours is, you know, may or may not be the priority at any given moment. So you have to keep um, very politely checking in and making sure that it's still a priority for them. Um, so those are my uh, key things that I wanted to share. If you have questions or want to know about more about how I use Twitter, please feel free to contact me. Um, I would love to talk with you about that. So thanks. I'll turn it back over now. Thank you so much, Jean. And I know that we're going to have some questions um, once we hear from our other presenters. So now I'm going to turn things over to Erica. Hi, everyone. Uh, that was a lot of great information from Jean. And um, boy, I learned a lot. So I'm sure you all did, too. Um, I'm going to try not to repeat anything that she talked about. But um, so my name is Erica Fleury. I serve as the program director of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance. And so today I'll talk to you about NAPSA's experiences working with the media and how your organization can work with journalists to increase your exposure and attract some attention and, and potentially donors. So I will be taking a step back from what Jean talked about and explaining how your organization can organize itself and, and work most effectively. So before we begin, just a little bit about NAPSA. Uh, we are an alliance of 10 of the leading primate sanctuaries on the continent who care for over 850 non-human primates rescued and retired from biomedical research, the entertainment industry, and the pet trade. Um, so NAPSA only has one employee, and that's me. So we're set up a little differently than some other organizations may be. And as a result of that, I often find myself in the position to speak on behalf of all of our members. And there's some challenges inherent in that that I'll talk about in a bit. So on average, NAPSA is in the news about one to two times a month. Um, there are a number of categories in which we find it easiest to get media attention. Uh, that can be legal changes, um, 
shock value. And what I mean by that is uh, stories that, you know, are really sort of bizarre or unexpected, or even just that have imagery that are bizarre, um, such as monkey rodeos and our advocacy work on that. Um, and also anytime a celebrity is involved, uh, we become, in relation to our advocacy work, we talk a lot about primates as pets. And as I'm sure you all are aware, there's been um, a history of some celebrities having monkeys uh, as pets. So that tends to get picked up in the media pretty easily once we speak up. So how do we do that? Um, for certain projects that are funded by grants, NAPSA has used public relations consultants to guide us. But I know that is often not possible for sanctuaries or smaller organizations that are nonprofits. So that's not a problem. Uh, what we've done is establish a public relations committee internally that guides my work. Uh, this committee is one of our most active and it's tasked with ensuring that the Alliance is prepared to speak up when something pops up in the news um, and that we respond appropriately when that happens. So, you know, most of our coverage is related to advocacy. And so you'll see this talk is a bit heavy on that. Um, but in order to be prepared to speak on these topics, NAPSA's Public Affairs Committee has done some homework. And so we prepared some documents that back us up on certain topics that are the hot button issues. Uh, we have public, um, we have uh, position statements on the use of primates as pets. We have educational resources on topics like how to identify a sanctuary. And some of those, um, you know, questions that NAPSA gets that I'm sure other sanctuaries get as well about the sanctuary world in general and about our specific work with primates. So I think it's important that even for a smaller organization, you don't ignore this first step of, of creating a committee. It can be small. It can be one to two people, you know, scale it down based on your organization and its, its needs and its availability. But that really helps to have more than one set of eyes on the communications work that you do. Um, trust me, it really helps to not do it alone. And so because some of our media coverage is reactionary, um, it's important that we stay on top of what's going on in the world. We have Google Alerts set up uh, to pull stories and, and bring it to my attention anytime there's something monkey or ape related um, so we don't miss anything if it's a busy week. It's happened. Um, when we feel it will be useful, NAPSA will prepare uh, an official response to an organization or a corporation or even um, post something online or, or submit a position, an opinion piece to a publication. Um, and that's anytime we see a misleading message related to the treatment of primates or their exploitation. When the topic that we're responding to becomes more of a national story, that's when the attention shifts back to NAPSA and we find ourselves in the public eye. So if you've identified something problematic, uh, your organization can respond directly to the offender, uh, whether that's you know um, a company using a primate in advertising or a person promoting the use of primates as pets, um, or you can make an educational post and share it online and hope it gets shared far and wide. There's ways that you'll have more luck doing this. I've got some, some bullet points on the screen here, but really think about as you're scrolling through the internet, what appeals to you. Nobody is reading paragraphs of text. You've got someone's attention for a fraction of a second. And so what works for us is bold text, a photo that grabs their attention, a hashtag, a very short, concise message that explains what the problem is and, and that your organization is on top of it. Uh, we use a program called PicMonkey. Uh, that's a, a free online program. So if you don't have a way to create these graphics, I, I can assure you there, there's options online that can help you do that. So the key to successfully attracting media attention is often simply being prepared. Um, you can see Jamie at Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest here doing some homework, <laughs> and that's really what it's all about. So. Um, your public affairs committee can help you by preparing some of those documents that I talked about already, um, some position statements, some educational resources, um, and even preparing sound bites. That's something that Jean mentioned, and I'll talk about that because that is so important. Um, but the more background materials you can have to support your stance on an important topic, the better off you'll be to speak publicly about it. Now, nobody's going to contact you if they don't know how to find you. So make sure your website is clear, make sure you have email and phone number very clearly listed. And NAPSA even has a mention, you know, for media contacts, con use this, contact us here. Um, 
once they've worked with you, they're more likely to work with you again when something comes up in your field. So keep that in mind that this may not be a one time thing. This, you know, you can build a real relationship here with some journalists. Once you do get a call, it's easy to panic, uh, particularly if you don't have a lot of experience. But but it's important to remember that they reached out to you for a reason. You know, you're an expert. You have something to share. You have a story to tell. So stay calm and do your best. Um, sometimes if the call is scheduled, you can prepare ahead of time uh, using some of the, the tips that Jean recommended with bullet points and your messaging. But sometimes that call is unexpected and it's important not to uh, you know, lose that chance. So grab it when you can. Um, as you're talking, repeat those key points over and over because those sound bites are something that the journalists are going to latch onto and use in the headline or use in a text box that they pull out in a video clip, and that's that's really important for you to, to prepare. So NAPSA has uh, come up with some sound bites that we've used on a variety of topics that have been successful for us. One of those is primates can never be domesticated. That is so easy and short, but it, it refutes so many arguments about primate exploitation, and it really gets our point across well. So I think that's um, you know something you can work on. Something else that worked for us was when um, when Justin Bieber was uh, expressing an interest in getting a second pet monkey after his first had been confiscated. We responded and we used the word foolish about his desire to get a, a pet monkey. And for some reason, that word foolish like grabbed everyone's attention and was repeated all over in all these different outlets. So sometimes you don't know what's going to work, but you know, use your head and think about an easy way to show your opinion on this hot button issue. Now, some people are a nervous wreck when they have to talk to the media and some aren't. You'll quickly learn which one you are. Um, when I was about six months into this position with NAPSA, I got my first call for a television interview. And not only was it television, but it was a live Skype interview with CNN. And this was because um, primates or chimpanzees had just been declared endangered in the United States. So uh, I had about two hours to prepare and I had a, a young infant at the time. So I really had no time to prepare. <laughs> and uh, and it was it was a bit it was a bit of a you know, I was thrown right into it. I, I had to talk to, you know, the person I was speaking to, the journalist. I couldn't even see this man uh, on my screen. I saw a black box. And he had a very heavy accent and I was just terrified that I that I wouldn't be able to hear him or that I would misunderstand or, you know, freeze. But but I didn't. I mean, you breathe, you remember your bullet points and you do the best you can. So um, it's really important for NAPSA and for me to keep in mind that that due to our setup, I'm speaking on not only on behalf of me, but on behalf of our 10 member sanctuaries and their viewpoints that can vary on a number of topics. So some of our sanctuaries, for instance, are very comfortable speaking out about um, to end the use of primates in biomedical research. And some others aren't because they have to maintain relationships with researchers in order to get primates retired. So that's a topic that I have to avoid or speak very carefully about. Jean mentioned that it's okay to not answer a question that you're not comfortable answering. And that's absolutely true. It You really have to think on the go when you're talking to a journalist and you have to make sure that you're not misrepresenting anything or that they can't take any of your comments out of context. And that's challenging and that's why these nerves come up and that's normal. So um, at the end of the day, you just have to try and remember that you have valuable viewpoints and experiences. Um, and so your daily work caring for animals at your sanctuaries can translate into helping animals beyond your reach through your work with the media. That's why you're doing this. And that's why, you know, yeah, it'd be easier to never talk to the media and to just keep doing your day-to-day -day work, but you have the option here and the opportunity to help to, to expand your scope. And that's really valuable. And I urge you not to take that lightly. So um, if, if by chance something, you know, you do an interview and you're not thrilled with how it came out, or you don't like how you look on the screen, or even, you know, something was quoted inaccurately from you, don't, you know, you're going to be your own worst critic. Don't take it too seriously. You have to remember that in this day and age, the internet news travels so fast and changes so quickly that 
no one's going to remember this in a day except you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, life goes on and, and do your best and you'll be okay. Once you are uh, featured in the media, I think it's great to show it off. It shows that your organization is pushing for more and trying to help everyone that you can. Um, don't forget to share this. So when NAPS is in the news, first I notify our members. And I do that because they may get requests or questions from people saying, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Or tell me more about this. And I want them to be prepared and not surprised. So um, after that, we'll post it on social media. We will also um, sometimes I'll email our email list if it's newsworthy enough. But there's a delicate line between, you know, inundating everyone every time you're in the news if it's not necessary. Um, I also post this on our website's NAPSA in the news section. Um, this not only helps me keep track of our history of media mentions, but I think it helps establish NAPSA as a spokesperson for the sanctuary community. Um, and it shows journalists who may be interested in working with us that we have experience doing this. I think if someone maybe wasn't sure if they should contact us about a certain topic, if they see that we have these experiences working with you know, large outlets to small local ones, they may be more likely to approach us. So I think that's always helpful. Don't be afraid to brag. Uh, this is work that you've, you've done well and earned, and I think it's important to show it off. So really, that's it for today. Um, I'm, you know, I'm always available for questions. You can go to NAPSA's website, primatesanctuaries.org, and the contact us section comes right to me. So I'll answer any questions you have. And I also want to point out that we have an advocacy section on our website that not only um, includes the outreach we've done about exploitation, but also has all those documents I've mentioned, those position statements, those educational resources. Um, those are all there, including others for your use and for just the public to use as they might need. So if you do similar work um, in advocacy and you need some backup materials, check NAPSA's website because we, we just may have something you need. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Erica. That was some great advice and some steps that any sanctuary can take to get started. Um, we'll take some questions at the end, but now we're gonna turn it over to Taylor Johnson from Jim Haven. Hi, thank you for having me. And this has been great information so far. Uh, Jackie thought it might be helpful for me to share a little bit more about how, uh, what it was like to have a production crew on site doing a documentary series and also what the differences are with that experience versus traditional media. So uh, as she talked about, Meet the Chimps uh, is a six-part documentary series that was filmed by a UK production house named Blank Productions, and they filmed it for National Geographic uh, to air on Disney+. Plus. And so all six episodes dropped middle of October of this year. But as Jean said, the media, especially a TV show, is a really long process. And so we actually started conversations in early 2019, it took about seven or eight months from that initial email uh, to start production. It was about seven months of production and that was intermittent. And so I'll speak to that in a second. And then about another eight months before it aired, we were fortunate to film, uh, have a wrap party right before the pandemic hit in February. And so uh, it all worked out from a timing perspective. Uh, some things that were very important uh, for us in terms of making the decision was an alignment with the intent of the series. And so from the very beginning, the way that Blink talked about the type of TV show they wanted to make aligned completely with our brand. Had it not aligned with the brand, we would not have moved forward. And uh, they wanted to create a family-friendly educational series that really highlighted the chimps and their personalities and hopefully created a connection between viewers and how unique each of the chimps were and their family groups. And they wanted to do a series that really uh, presented Life at the Sanctuary from a chimps perspective. And so um, we feel like they were successful in that. And that was something that was important to us as well. Of course, of utmost importance is just guaranteeing that there's ethical representation and production. Uh, we were confident knowing National Geographic and Disney and their animal welfare practices. We got to know Blink. We had a trust um, with them. I would say also in addition to this, that importance of the foundation of trust is having um, expectation setting conversations from the beginning. And so what that meant to us is that the chimps always came first, always. 
And so we talked about what that would mean when it you know, got down to the really granular level. For example, um, when they wanted to rig um, our habitats with cameras. And so they knew our schedule. They knew when our staff team were going in to clean. And they did the camera rigging when our staff were cleaning. So it didn't impact the chimp schedule. Uh, we also really uh, needed to share with them. And as you all know, how unpredictable uh, working with animals can be. And so everything from um, if it's not working out for a chimps to be introduced on a certain day, even if it was part of their filming schedule, when, you know, we weren't doing it. It's um, always that the chimps uh, came first. Initially, we thought that they would focus on a handful of our key staff members uh, for the people portion, uh, but really it ended up being that they interviewed lots of people and, and many of our team members and so many people were involved in production. And that also meant that they really made the chimps the true stars, which um, we always feel like the chimps are the stars. So that was um, fantastic for us. Looked on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, our filming blocks were scheduled in advance. And so TV series, from what I understand, can be produced a number of ways. Uh, they can be on site and live there, if you will. Ours was not like that. And so we had blocks. They were about two uh, weeks long. We did five to six blocks. Uh, and you can see the dates there. The storylines were set as much as possible in advance. They knew what major stories they wanted to follow. And that really helped us from a scheduling perspective and just letting our staff know what was coming up and what to expect when they were on site for their you know, two to three weeks. The crew size for us was about nine to 11 people. Uh, they did the wide variety of things involved in filming a documentary series. A uh, portion of those were film crews and so they did uh, they had an observational film crew, and those were the people that uh, interviewed our staff team. And then they had the long life uh, wildlife camera crew that uh, both did the long life filming or long range filming, and then also operated the rigs. They had a trailer and panned and zoomed and that type of thing. Um, as I said, schedules were shared as far in advance as possible. And then uh, our team, so I lead our development and communications team, were really uh, critical <laughs> and um, to the whole process from the perspective of just making sure it all went well. Uh, we were always with our staff team that were being interviewed, uh, no matter, you know, if that's, we were just always there. So that sometimes meant we were like hiding behind a barrel, you know, outside of the film, you know, the filming camera. And other times it meant we were outside the door. So we were always there just making sure our staff team felt comfortable. From a safety perspective, uh, and PPE guidelines, we, they were expected to follow all of our rules. And so that meant they went through uh, pretty rigorous uh, safety training as well as just escape drill type thing. Anything you would typically do to ensure the safety of your staff, uh, they went through. They followed all of our PPE guidelines. And then they were always accompanied by animal care staff and veterinary staff when they were anywhere close to the chimps or in chimp areas. And so for us, uh, we have a number of buildings that only animal care staff are in and out of. Anytime they needed to be there, they were always with either an animal care staff or a vet staff. And then, as I said, when we're filming staff team members, we are always having a communication teams member as well. There were a ton of logistics. I'd say that first couple of weeks uh, it was like much learning on the go. Everything from just like basics of like where they park and how they use their radios and making sure it wasn't disrupting just general sanctuary logistics day to day. Uh, there was a lot and expected to be a lot. From a team perspective, of course, we wanted our team to welcome the film crew and also the trust. I think uh, both Jean and Erica really pointed to how traditional media, they're looking for a hook and a story and also controversy. And so this whole process was totally different than uh, really traditional interviews where our team is a little bit more guarded and they're you know, making sure they stick to certain messaging points and they stay kind of on script, if you will, for whatever they the interview was about. This is so different. We needed them to feel comfortable around the crew, to show their personalities, to talk about their day to day, just things that we would never uh, would never be of interest to traditional media was of interest and you know important part of the show. Uh, the participation in the story idea brainstorming. So um, like I said, and like you all know, traditional media is not interested in uh, chimp uh, dynamics and family structure and who's going to be alpha and, you know, how did Midge and Henry like one another? And so we had to ask them to think differently about their jobs and think about like if people, you know, that don't know chimps and don't know about a sanctuary, what would they be interested in? And some of their most basic day-to-day -day tasks were 
a really interesting and important uh, parts of the story. Of course, like this is something that you would expect really training people to feel comfortable speaking up if they had any concerns, uh, whether that was PPE or if they didn't feel comfortable with a question. We didn't encounter that, but we wanted to make sure people felt confident that we were supporting them and that you know they, sh they can and should speak up. Um, we've talked about logistics and then you know really strict confidentiality from our team uh, working with Disney and National Geographic. They had uh, obvious expectations about wanting to drop the story themselves and be be the lead in that. And so it meant for our team that we signed a lot of documents, uh, non-disclosure, confidentiality, and waivers uh, to be on camera. Uh, we couldn't take photographs or video. And then it was you know 2019 when most of this was filmed. And so there are a lot of people in and out of the sanctuary, visitors, events, that type of thing. And it was um, a big relief when everything was made public so that they could talk about it because we really uh, impressed upon them uh, monthly, regularly, that uh, they just couldn't have conversations about the crew or what was happening at the sanctuary. Uh, so we have a, a few lessons learned, um, a number of lessons learned, and I didn't put my contact information, but anyone is welcome to reach out if you have questions. Um, know that if you do a, a documentary series or a TV series, the investment of time and resources is really incredible. Um, it's also a much more collaborative process, and so it's you're you know, making the decision to um, be a, a long-term lengthy effort. You must have the staff buy-in. We trained all of our staff. We did extensive training for the folks that we thought would be on camera, but we also didn't want to do so much training that they felt like they needed to be a certain way or show up a certain way. We wanted them to be themselves. You'll need full-time staff support. I would say at least two to three people dedicated to production while they're on site. We had two. Uh, team members that focused in that way as a long process and then expect um, some legal contracts. Uh, really rethinking what constitutes a story. Uh, traditional media, you want it to be really simple, uh, short word count. It, if it's broadcast at 75 seconds to two minutes for us, based on the format and the intent of the TV series they were trying to create, you know, we really thought differently, as I mentioned about um, our day-to-day -day life at the sanctuary. Uh, importance of negotiating. Um, this for us was as, you know, it's not simple anymore just to say like that can't be filmed. We tend to be really protective about what we film at the sanctuary when media comes out. Um, but we needed to provide the ability for them to have insight to day to day life. And so for us, we traditionally would not have, um, we you know, transport chimpanzees, you know, introduce them to sanctuary life. We wouldn't have ever filmed before this the unloading process. That's just not something we've done before. Um, but we know we needed to compromise and think about it. We talked about the angles. I was there and I knew at any time I could stop filming if I didn't feel comfortable. So we ended up getting them what they needed in a way that was really comfortable for us. And that's really important. Um, also in negotiating, you can and should expect to negotiate editorial review. Um, unlike with traditional media, they're not going to show you their story in advance. You're just going to see it with the rest of the world. For us, we knew it was important to at least uh, see the first cut and have the ability to do fact checking. And also, if we had any concerns um, that we could have brought those up at that time, we didn't. Um, it was a great relationship, but we wanted to make sure up front that we had that ability and that was written into the contract. You also uh, can and should negotiate a location fee. Um, Importance of trust. I'll wrap up with this. I know we want to leave time for questions, uh, but the trust is the foundation for everything. And um, you are committing to quite the relationship. And so uh, not only trusting them, but also you know building that relationship so that they trust the sanctuary. They trust that you're going to bring stories forward, that you can have like really um, candid interaction and communication is also important. So I will I will wrap up with that and leave time for questions. Um, Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few more slides that you want to. Oh, I just um, we did some media surrounding um, like when it came out. And so we did a satellite media tour. And I wondered if we'd get the question about what um, boost we've seen at the sanctuary. We uh, feel like it's pretty early since we're just three months out and since it lives ongoing on Disney Plus. But we have seen a really nice increase in interest as well as um, in, in year-end donations, so. Great, thank you. 
Um, that was fantastic and um, a really great behind the scenes look at how that all came together. And I encourage anyone who has questions to write them in. We do have a couple of them already. And Taylor, there was actually a question for you about this Blink team and how they came up with the storylines. Did you have a sense of what kind of advance work they did to know about your chimps and, and, and the sanctuary before it all started? Absolutely. So they were on site doing um, just on site you know, initial tours of the sanctuary, getting to know our staff people well in advance. Uh, we kind of blocked out based on where the chimps were living at the time, knowing that chimps for us move um, from habitat to habitat pretty often just so they get new novel experiences. But uh, we had some chimps that were in certain habitats and family groups that we thought had really interesting personalities that they might like to film. And so in advance, we worked out like most likely what families would they film and then our staff team knew what um like they could share different personalities or you know things that were happening in the day-to-day -day life of those chimps um we also knew like dramatic you know arcs that midge was coming to the sanctuary during the time they were on site and so you know big things like that we could plan for and know that you know he's arriving on this day he'll be in the welcome center for a particular amount of time he'll likely be introduced between these blocks um, and then there were things that came up while um, they were there. We were initially hesitant to have any sort of filming of anything medical related or vet related, just because that's not something we would typically do. Uh, but then, you know, they thought that was an important, you know, this important piece of what happens at the sanctuary. And so like the story of Sparky and the physical therapy he needed, like we eventually got comfortable with sharing those types of stories as they came up as well. So they could potentially film knowing that if we weren't comfortable with them filming that say, you know, not this time. I hope that answered your question. So it was a lot of initial, you know, play, family plan, you know, planning around the family groups, but then also on the go, you know, we involved our animal care team members in a lot of brainstorming meetings. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question about media and press kits, and especially for smaller sanctuaries that may not have their own marketing and communication staffs. Um, what what do you suggest putting in a kit? And do your organizations have media kits on the web on your websites? What kinds of things do they include? NAPSA doesn't have um, a media kit per se, but we do have a fact sheet. And, and now I'm regretting that I didn't include that. Um, we have a fact sheet about our organization that's one, a one page listing real basics so that any reporter interested can can understand what we do and don't do. Um, I think that's easy enough to do. And I do think everyone should have that on hand because it's it's a great way to hand it over to them without having to spend, you know, 10, 20 minutes on a conversation and then having them misunderstand something. How about Chim Haven? What do you have on your website as kind of uh, information starting point for media? Sure, we do have a media kit. It's a number of pages. It's about the sanctuary, our mission. It has FAQs, a timeline, and then also our media contact information. And PASA, I know PASA has a lot of information on your website. Is there, I don't recall if there's a particular for the media link. We're uh, more like NAPSA in that regard. We do not have a, a media kit or a media center on the, the website. Um, I do have a fact sheet that I'll send out to reporters. Um, it's uh, similar to what uh, Erica was just describing, just kind of just the facts, the basics of who we are, what we do, what's kind of what's our reach, what's our impact. So that um, if I'm going into a call, they're not starting with absolutely no information about us. I. Um, you know, they may, may or may not read it, but uh, at least they've been armed. Great. Thank um, you. Another thing I'll just speak up here that we found really helpful is also having photos and video um, and B-roll for um, media re like ready to go. And so we have different drop boxes that we'll send to media and it's really easy for them to pick up. Great. Thank you so much for that question. And thank you for the responses. Um, another question is, uh, there's no mention of press releases. And Jean, you talked about the importance of you know, finding the right contacts and how to go about doing that. Is there any value to using press releases and putting them out on like a wire service? And if so, what are some examples of instances where a press release was an effective way to reach the media? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so a, a press release is not a great way to get an article written about your organization, in my opinion. Um, it is a it's a essentially a broadcast medium of its own, um, and it can do a lot of good for you um, in terms of propagating a, a contained message in a lot of places where you may or may not have relevant, um, you know, relevant audience. Um, it's not a, it's a tool that I use, um, to announce kind of big things that PASA has done. Um, you know, for instance, we just had a Siddle Marsden award winner, which is an annual award that we do. So we did a press release about that. Um, so kind of big formal things, I'll, I'll issue them and I do use a wire service. Um, and then they can also be um, kind of a sneaky way to do good SEO for your website if you have a space on your site for that. So um, excellent way to get keywords uh, and fresh content on the site. So, um, and you can get some backlinks uh, as well. So from a kind of a digital strategy point of view, they, they can do some, some lifting for you and it's a pretty easy way to do that. But, um, but I never send them to reporters. Um, I may pitch a reporter about something that's in a press release, but I would never send them a press release. I will always personalize a pitch to them. Great. Um, Taylor, do you, does Chimhaven use press releases for, you know, announcing uh, new arrivals coming to the sanctuary or other big news? Is that an effective means of communication? We do. I mean, I completely agree with Jane. Um, we also contract with a firm to help with our press releases and with, you know, our media communications and then um, any requests that come in. I'd say we definitely do uh, announcements, major milestones, and then also sometimes around events and things. And that'll get picked up more by local media, travel and tourism. Uh, but generally, I mean, I, I agree. It's the just those two kind of categories for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about uh, the videos that our sanctuaries post on their social media channels. And, you know, sometimes they become really popular and start going viral. So what advice would you give to a sanctuary when they're having a real successful viral video? What's the first thing they should do to leverage that momentum? How can they take that to the next step and get some media coverage? Anyone? <laughs> I don't think it's it's not very relevant to NAPSA just because NAPSA doesn't itself post that original content. So I'm going to stick back and, and let the others answer that. I'm happy to share a few ideas. Uh, so making sure you've got a really clear call, call to action and the information that is, you know, whether it's on Instagram and you've got it written, um, but you need to have like the link, making sure it links back to your site, making sure if someone goes to your site, they can sign up for, you know, email subscription. Book, you know, anyone that likes or views, you can go and ask them to like your page. Uh, we've found that you know, boosting really successful posts um, helps them do even better. And so that's another option for you. So those are just a, a few. Great. Um, also, some sanctuaries say that they are contacted by companies about licensing their videos. And is that a good idea or is they should they be concerned about losing control of the narrative of the video or having that, that video be exploited for the wrong message? Does that come up with any PASA sanctuaries? Because I know so many of their stories go viral. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to whether or not they've been approached on licensing. Um, Caitlin actually on the call may may have better insight into that. Um, I do know they they definitely their videos go viral and then there's a range of opinion on um, kind of the from you know live and let live and anybody can use anything on the one extreme and total lockdown and control on the other extreme and and we have the whole spectrum we have 23 members and they um, and they are you know obviously it's a very personal choice about your brand and and the relationships you have with the animals. Uh, so how you how you navigate that. Um, so I, I don't think that from a PASA point of view, as a for us as an organization, we don't have a, a particular policy in that, just kind of knowing that there's a range of um, perspectives within our membership. Um, yeah, this is Caitlin. I can also just add to what Jean is saying. Uh, we do get contacted about licensing videos, but like very similar to NAPSA, these videos aren't 
pastas videos. They're the sanctuaries. And me most often the companies are sort of just sort of viral video machines. And I don't feel like their brand as a company really matches the brand of any of our sanctuaries or members. So I do forward those onto the sanctuaries, but it doesn't happen too often directly for PASA. I, I would imagine that it happens fairly frequently for the uh, the sanctuary members themselves, though. I think it raises the, the important point, too, related to advocacy, that sanctuaries have such a responsibility to ensure that the content that they put out is responsible in a way that when a person scrolling looks at it, that they don't think that primates make good pets or should be used in entertainment. You know, I know there's a big drive now to have even caregiver staff not post selfies with animals because it's so easy for uneducated people or people, you know, people just that, that don't know the issues to misinterpret that and think, oh, you know, it's okay to pose with it with wild animals. It's okay for them to be near humans and all these, all these issues that arise. So, um, you know, it would be, it would be easy for one of those uh, companies that Caitlin mentioned to grab something off your website that maybe has verbiage explaining its purpose, but that, that, you know, they don't take that. They take an image that then could be shared widely and could completely distort the message of your organization. So I just know that's something that's really relevant right now for sanctuaries and anyone caring for animals. Great point, thank you. Um, I have some questions about social media influencers, which is another uh, completely different way that uh, media attention can be brought to sanctuaries or other organizations. Have any of you ever collaborated with social media influencers and how can a sanctuary seek that collaboration? Recently, NAPSA has. Um, we are currently leading a fundraiser to rescue 32 chimpanzees from a, a non-member sanctuary that closed in Los Angeles. And so uh, it has attracted some celebrity support. Um, I, you know, there, there are people that aren't only influencers, but they're known for being actors and actresses. Um, we have had them create video content promoting our message, linking back to the fundraiser site. Um, but to be honest, I haven't seen it translate into a huge jump in donations. And I think that's um, an accurate, that's sort of what our fundraising professionals expected, to be honest, um, that celebrity slash in, uh, influencer support doesn't always translate to funds. Um, it can help spread your message, but, you know, we, we needed the money as well. <laughs> so it was a little disappointing. We don't have a formal influencer program right now. We did host a group of influencers related to the Travel and Tourism Bureau locally. Um, I would agree with Erica in terms of just you know, expectations around influencer support. We did have amazing attendance at that at our last discovery day that we had in 2019. And, you know, it's hard to point back to exactly what helps drive that attendance and what part of the media is, is doing it. Um, but we are considering influencers in the future as a way to help spread the message, but um, not necessarily as a fundraising tool. Thank you. Uh, well, Erica and Taylor, you both kind of made the exception for not using it as a fundraising tool. And that leads to another question, because Jean, you had said that when you're, you're trying to place an article, it's not about you. But sometimes the sanctuary does want it to be about them if they you know, really want to bring attention to an urgent situation at the sanctuary, uh, a, a rescue, and a, a number of new arrivals come to the sanctuary, and they want media attention so that they can raise funds. Do you have any advice for sanctuaries that do want to use media as a way to um, you know, raise that attention and hopefully get new funding? Yeah. Um I would say in that instance that, uh, for instance, like a new rescue is a great opportunity um, because even though it's, you know, you're going to lead to yourself, you're actually leading with uh, a situation that an animal is in um, and that's going to generate a lot of interest and a lot of sympathy um, and, and people care about that. So I always think about, you know, you start with that thing that's outside yourself that, that you know, resonates and grabs people's attention and then you lure them in and get them kind of into your zone um, 
and that's 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 how I would advise uh, any anybody who's wanting to do kind of get to that place, get that get that adorable chimp face out there, uh, or donkey face, or whatever animal your your is yours. Um, tell the story in a deep emotive terms and be honest. I mean, these animals have amazing stories and uh, inspiring stories, uh, and the people who are involved in the rescue are heroic and and certainly right now this there's hunger to to see that goodness uh, in action I think people are so exhausted with uh, the negativity that there's a chance to really be in front of um, in front of the media with great stories that can um, open the purse strings too so that that would be my advice i I concur and I think that using that store of cute animal photos and videos that you all have if you work at a sanctuary is so valuable and easy for you. And it's a great way to get someone's attention online because you can use that photo to grab their attention, but then also link to it, as Jean mentioned, your whatever the message is, whether it's fundraising or, you know, a story or a need. Um, and, and it's worked for NAPSA for sure. Great, thank you. Um, we probably have time for one more question. I, I had a question for, for Taylor because you mentioned um, as part of the preparation for the film crew coming on your sanctuary that you trained your staff. And can you give a little more guidance to our audience of, of how you would train a staff to work with the media, to be careful about messaging, what guidelines you give them, things like that? Sure. We um, have a standard media training and we work to train up uh, not just our senior team members, but, you know, a number of animal care team members from across departments, just so we have a wide range of people that are both interested in talking to the media and then have received that training. Uh, we talk about, you know, being comfortable on camera, um, what questions they may ask. We did um, a video uh, training where we recorded them, you know, answering questions and talked about tips and um, we did it in a group setting so we can learn from one another. Uh, but we definitely have the additional tools for people around, you know, handling tough questions. I'd say that's not something we really had a concern about with uh, the television crew because we, you know, set those expectations up front and we knew what they were really looking for. And so for uh, traditional media versus the documentary series, it was just a different experience. Uh, but we we do uh, train our team members and um, ask them to be at the ready for different opportunities. Great, thank you. Um, any other advice uh, that you would like to give to sanctuaries in terms of working with their staffs and, and preparing them to speak with the media? I just think practice makes perfect. And even if it's you know, once a month practicing how to answer tough questions or how to effectively communicate a message goes so far. Because then even if you're not getting practice talking directly to journalists, you'll be ready when it when it happens. And that confidence goes a long way. Great. Um, well, I think we're at the top of the hour and that was our last question. Um, certainly invite everyone to visit the PASA, NAPSA, Chimpaven websites and see what they have uh, as far as position statements and other information. Give some great guidance on, on things maybe you can add to your website so you can be more media ready. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin for any final housekeeping. Um, again, just want to thank the presenters. Really great information. Um, I'm so happy to have had you here. Thank you to everybody for attending. As I mentioned, we will get the link to the recording to everybody, um, hopefully early next week, Week, excuse me. Um, so again, thank you everyone for attending and thank you to our presenters. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.